Um, this morning, it seems apropos that this uh, program was scheduled for today because the day after uh, Passover, so <laughs> everybody's going to be in the mood for pizza. Um, Steve Delinsky is currently the food reporter at NBC, uh, where his Food Guy reports air every Thursday night at 10 p.m., He's also the author of Pizza City USA, 101 Reasons Why Chicago is America's Greatest Town. And there's copies of the book right outside, and I'm sure Steve will be happy to autograph them for you if you'd like a copy of the book. Um, in order to write the book, he visited 185 uh, places in the Chicago area over the course of six months. Um, the ultimate, and he's come out with a second book, The Ultimate Chicago Pizza Guide. It's a comprehensive guide to the history of the styles, locales, and the people that make the Windy City a prime destination for slices and pies. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, the first book, uh, which came out four, four years ago, uh, was kind of my attempt to kind of get to the bottom of it once and for all, like who makes the best pizza in town. And I read a listicle online of the quote unquote seven hottest pizza places. I'm going to set away for the Zoom folks at home. Um, I'd seen a listicle online and it said these are the seven hottest pizza places in Chicago. And I really took issue with it because I felt like the writer hadn't done the legwork had you know, been boots on the ground, eating the pizzas. It was sort of based on hearsay or reputation. And I think one of the problems with Chicago as a pizza town is this reputation factor. It's sort of urban myths. And I grew up in Minnesota, although I lived in Chicago for 30 years. So I, now I finally consider myself a local. But I've re I realized that people from Chicagoland, um, they continue these myths about certain places like, you know, Aurelio's and Homewood and Flossmoor. you got to use the old oven. And, you know, Barnaby's with the crimped edges. My wife is from the North Shore, so of course Barnaby's is her favorite pizza. People have these things like in, written into their DNA. Like I call it peak syndrome, pizza I grew up eating syndrome. You know, it's, there's nothing better than when you grow up eating in Chicago. Land. And so um, since I didn't grow up here, I don't have those built-in biases. So I sort of looked at everything with fresh eyes. Nobody got a free pass. And I said, okay, I'm going to just tackle this once and for all. I've done other single subject um, approaches for my job at, at formerly ABC7, now at NBC. I've done um, Italian beef sandwiches. I've done Vietnamese spa. In both those cases, I went to like 31 places just to kind of get a sense for lay of the land. So I figured for pizza it would be a little bit more than that. So I figured maybe 40 or 50 places I would go. Um, and I'd leave myself three months. And I'll just see how this goes. And so as I was going out, kind of, I, I sort of approached it like Sherman sort of moving through the South. Like, you know, now I'm going to go to Wheaton and then Naperville, and then I'm going to go to Glenview and Northbrook, and I'm going to go to, you know, Lincolnwood, and I'm going to kind of moving my way around Chicagoland in these waves, three, four places a day, usually minimum two bites, you know, one from the tip and one from the heel. Most of a pizza experience is about the crust, frankly. Um, you don't need to eat a whole pizza to get a sense of the pizza place. A lot of times I can tell just by looking at the pizza if it's going to be good or not, because you can kind of look at the crust, underdone or not. And uh, making notes along the way, you know, looking at things like OBR, which is a term I came up with which stands for optimal bite ratio. <laughs> it's really important. Right? You think, about, think about a sandwich, think about a taco, piece of pizza, what is it you like or dislike? It's, about, it's the balance, usually. It's not about, you know, how good is the cheese melted. It's, you know, every bite, are you getting equal amounts of crust cheese sauce topping? You know, which is one of the fails for stuffed pie, because it's so much. It's two layers of dough, sort of top layer, bottom layer, lots of cheese in the middle. You end up getting kind of a one-note experience. And so I'm looking for OBR. I'm looking for you know, the quality of the crust um, and the toppings. You know, are they off the back of a Cisco truck, commodity, you know, pepperoni or are they handmade homemade in-house cured in-house etc 
So the first wave, about three months, I went to about 76 places and I wrote the results on my website, my personal website, like top five tavern style in the city, top five tavern style in the suburbs, etc. top five deep dish, blah, blah, blah. But what I realized was we're more than deep dish and tavern, we're really multiple styles of pizza in the city. There's Sicilian and Roman and Neapolitan and artisan and stuff, you, know, you name it. So there's a lot more than New York City. A lot of folks from New York will say, oh, you can't find good New York slices in Chicago, which is true to some extent, but it's really changed over the last five or six years. Um, and unlike New York, where they only have five styles, pretty much, slices, squares, artisan, Neapolitan, and maybe grandma, um, in Chicago, we've got really 10 styles, which I'll talk about today. So this first wave I went, I found 76 places, wrote about it, web traffic on my website went through the roof. I pitched the idea to Northwestern University Press as a book, and they said, that's a great idea. How many of those 76 would you say are really recommendable? I said, about 50. So okay, well, can you do like 100 for the book, or 101? That's like a nice, good promotable number. So to get that, I went to 185 in, in total over six months to get to 101 that I could really recommend for the first book. And then what happened was in the intervening years, we started a pizza tour business called Pizza City USA. I've got information outside about that. We do four tours every weekend from Memorial Day through Halloween. Uh, always multiple styles of pizza. You meet the owners, you go you know, sort of backstage to sort of see how they make the stuff. And then started a podcast called Pizza City every other Friday. And then during the pandemic, when everybody was making sourdough bread at home, I was reading about all these amazing pizza pizza places opening up and all these chefs pivoting from their jobs as you know line cooks to pizza makers. And a lot of pizzerias were really the ones that were surviving during the pandemic because it's portable to go, it's affordable, it checks all the boxes for people typically. Um, and so I saw this another wave of pizza. So that's where the second book, The Ultimate Chicago Pizza Guide, just came out, um, which we brought today. That is kind of the impetus for this this, this next book, is this third wave of the pandemic. So um, let's see here. OK, so what is Chicago-style pizza? Well, what is Chicago-style pizza? What do you think it is? What would you say Chicago-style pizza means? Casserole, that's a good one. What else? Deep dish. Deep dish. That's it. Does anybody here like Barnaby's? I love it. Is that is Barnaby's a casserole or a deep dish? No. It's tavern style, square cut. That is what Chicago style means to me. That's the oldest style. It's been around since the 1920s. Um, casserole is a stuffed pie from 1971. Deep dish is from 1943. Those are kind of generally completely exciting. So. I think Chicago style means all three. It's it's a casserole if you're talking stuff, it's a deep dish if you're talking deep dish or pans or Gulliver's or Pequot's, and it's tavern style thin. Barnaby's and Home Run In and Vito and Nick's and Baracco's, Triano's, on and on. Pat's way more tavern style in Chicago land than the casseroles and the deep dishes. But unfortunately, this is what the rest of America thinks of Chicago or the casserole town. And that's really consumed most of the oxygen when it comes to discuss, discussing pizzas. So there are three ways to think about uh, the 1940s, post-war, uh, the 1970s, deep dish, and then the 20 teens, where we get into artisan style, and then really kickstarts in the pandemic. Um, we are the tavern and the deep dish in the stuffed city. And I say there are 10 styles of pizza in the second city. I think we have 10 distinct styles of pizza here. Um, all of which you're going to see at Pizza City Fest, July 23rd and 24th in the West Loop at Plumbers Hall. We have the whole parking lot taken over. I've curated 40 pizzerias over two days. We're going to be baking on ovens. It's going to be epic. So mark your calendars, pizzacityfest.com. Okay, the first pizza wave. Uh, boys were coming back from the war, and these existing taverns, like Home Run In, which I just did a story on Thursday night for NBC. They are celebrating 75 years of doing pizza, but they were a tavern in the 20s. And so guys like um, uh, Nick Perino came back from the war. His mother-in-law, Mary Grittani, was running this tavern. Her husband had passed away. Um, you can't really see her. Mary Grittani is right in the middle of the kitchen there at Home Run In. But 
instead of popcorn, you know, you, you give your patrons something salty to eat, like, you know, anybody remember the ground round in the mm -hmm. 70s with the peanuts in the shell? Yeah, we had that in, say, Minnesota. You want them to eat something, get something salty to get them to buy beer, because you, know, you make money on the alcohol, so you want them to buy beer. So instead of peanuts or popcorn, they would make salty pizza. In fact, the CEO of Home Run Inn, Dan Costello, was telling me he remembers as a kid, because his grandfather was uh, Nick Perino, he remembers as a kid that the salt, the sauce was quite salty. Um, even it seemed as a kid, it seemed too salty to him. But that was a trick to get people to buy more beer. So um, in 1947 um, or 46, a, um, it, was, it was across the street from a park on the south side on 31st Street. Uh, a baseball crashes through the front uh, window. The grandfather doesn't speak any English. He says, home run. Home run in is born. And they start doing these pizzas as freebies, as giveaways, as convenience. Put them on a cocktail napkin. You don't need a plate or a knife and fork. Um, have a few squares, have a few beers. You go home and have dinner with your family. That's the Chicago, the Midwestern working class tradition, really. Um, anybody from Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan knows about bar pies, bar tavern style pies. But this really became a thing in Chicago. In the 30s, uh, Vito and Nick's is another famous place on the southwest side. And um, in 1947, because people keep asking for this pizza, they become sort of de facto pizzerias, even though it really was a tavern. That's why we call this tavern style. Um, and then you have this part of the second wave from the 1940s, uh, deep dish comes on the scene. Now, lots of players involved in deep dish. We're going to tackle this subject once and for all at Pizza City Fest. I've got a historian, as well as Mark Malnati, the chairman for Malnati, who's going to be on this panel. But I, I really have been doing a lot of research on this, and I find it fascinating because, again, when you talk about myths in Chicago, the casserole myth or the deep dish myth, Ike Sewell picture here holding the slice at the bottom right. He's next to Rick Ricardo. Um, and folks of a certain age might remember Ricardo's from downtown. He was kind of a bon vivant, and um, uh, Cop, Herb Copset would cover him in his column, you know, what he was up to the other night. And um, he lived upstairs in this building that you see pictured here in the middle, P3 Uno at uh, the corner of Wabash in Ohio. He and his family lived upstairs, and there was a, a bar downstairs, there was a restaurant downstairs in the early 40s, late 30s, called the Pelican Club. And the Pelican Club had round, semi-deep pizza pans in their kitchen that they inherited once they left. They left them behind. So Ricardo took it over. It was invariably called Ricardo's and then the Pizzeria. They started doing pizzas there using the pans they had left over. And it was 1942, 1943, there's a war raging, and it's very difficult to get alcohol. And so Ricardo makes kind of a deal with the devil uh, in the form of Ike Sewell, who worked for Fleischmann's Liquors. And as you probably know, if you work for a liquor business, you cannot own a bar, as well as like a sort of a vertical separation of church and state there. And so they make a deal. I'm gonna, Sewell says, I'll supply you alcohol for your business, but you're going to put my wife on the deed to the business, Florence. Um, and it's not going to say Florence Sewell, it'll say Florence Davis, so it's not to attract attention. So on the deed of the business, 50-50 ownership, um, Mike Sewell's wife, Florence, and Rick Ricardo. That's going to come back to haunt him. Um, other two gentlemen on the left side you see there, they are celebrating the 10th anniversary of the, the P3 in 1953, is uh, Lou Malnati standing, and his father, Adolfo, who went by Ruby, seated. And uh, they both worked in the restaurant, at Ricardo's the pizzeria, uh, Adolfo was a manager, Lou was a bartender, uh, Lou was a Marine, actually, was stationed at Navy Pier, and Lou ends up becoming the manager because his father gets hit by a cab uh, and is kind of laid up, and so Lou becomes really the face of this pizzeria. Um, in 1954, Ricardo passes away suddenly, I don't forget how old he was, he wasn't very old, uh, leaves behind a wife and a couple of kids, as the deed says, Half the business profits um, from that year and $3,000 goes to his widow, and the rest of the business goes to Florence Davis, Mike Sewell's wife. So Mike Sewell takes over the business. 1954, a year later, they open up Pizzeria Due down the block. And when they open up Pizzeria Due, 
They said, why don't we call that the pizzeria something else? Why don't we call it Pizzeria Uno, since that was the first place we had. So 1955, we have two deep dish places in Chicago, Uno's and Duet's, both being run by Lou Malnati, basically. Um, uh, Lou, uh, the word I got from Mark Malnati, uh, Lou's son, was that Ike Sewell would basically use it as kind of a place to entertain and drink with his friends, but whether he wasn't involved in running the business day to day. So it's a little bit funny to see a plaque out in front of Uno's today that says this is where deep dish pizza was created in 1943 by Ike Sewell. It's not true, um, but you survive, you control the narrative, right? So this is what I love about the history of Chicago pizza. Um, and so Lou Malnati eventually goes to uh, Sewell and um, asks, that's why we're talking about here, we make the deal with Ike Sewell. Um, Ricardo dies in 54, Sewell takes over, opens Douay a year later, claims he invented it, and then rejects Lou Malnati's offer to buy it. Lou wants to be an equity partner, wants, he's like, I've been running both these restaurants and managing, opening and closing them every day. I'd like to have a, a, an equity stake. Um, Sewell says no. And Lou quits immediately and then takes 14 months off. And then in 1971, on St. Patrick's Day, opens Lou Malnati's in Lincolnwood, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Yes, okay. Um, and that has just taken off like gangbusters. There are more than 60 locations. They just sold about a year ago for a lot of money. Um, and, uh, and then Alice Mae Redmond does not get any credit in this story. Also, African-American chef from Mississippi, she leaves Douay's in the 60s uh, to go open a place called Gino's East with a couple of cab drivers who don't know anything about pizza, but they see that deep dish is becoming a thing. Uh, one of them is Fred Bartoli. Alice Mae Redmond realizes she cannot get this dough to press out, to pan out in the pan fast enough to meet demand. So she thinks back to her southern roots of uh, short dough, biscuit dough recipes with fat in it. Instead of using bacon fat, she's going to use oil. And so all of a sudden, in the mid-60s, you see more oil getting used into deep dish pans. Because the original deep dish, honestly, is not that deep. It's a deep pan, but the dough is not that thick. In fact, you ever go to Mai Pai, which is also 50 years old, like Lou Malnati's, Mai Pai does a very old-school style of deep dish. It's in a deep pan, but the middle of the pizza is about 5 eighths of an inch. Whereas the sides, the walls, if you will, are a little bit higher. Um, but that is what deep dish, there's a picture of my pie right there. That's what deep dish should have looked like in the 1940s. Because the guy who started my pie, Larry Aronson, it's funny how many Jews are in pizza and hot dogs, by the way. Um, he got the idea because he loved going to Uno's, but he didn't like what it did for his stomach. And so he changed the recipe with the sauce, less acid, I believe. Um, but anyway, Alice May Redmond also in, 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 um, an integral part of deep dish history. Um, deep dish architecture basically is a bottom crust. You see the sides pressed up along the side there. The difference between deep dish and deep pan, which would be like a Gulliver's, a Pequod's, a Burt's, is that deep dish, you press the dough along the sidewall. Uh, deep pan, you let the dough just kind of pan out to the edges and you leave it. You don't pinch any, you don't make a wall along the side. Um, La Briole is another good example of a deep pan. So deep dish, you layer the bottom with slices of mozzarella. This is to protect the bottom layer of dough from getting soggy. One of the reasons when you order a deep dish pizza to go, you always get it uncut, right? You're nodding your head, uncut. Because as soon as you cut into a deep pan, the sauce, the cheese are going to leak into the crevices and your bottom crust is going to get soggy. So always get a deep dish uncut. Your dough protects the bottom layer. Uh, your cheese protects the bottom layer, and then your toppings, typically in Chicago, pinched and pressed sausage, uh, raw bulk sausage, uh, so the fat renders into the pie as it bakes, and then a chunky reduced tomato sauce, uh, a little bit of pecorino romano, maybe oregano, that's it. Baked about 30 to 40 minutes, but um, that's, that's the deep dish architecture. Uh, the second wave is in the 70s, as I mentioned, Lou Malnati's opened in 71. My Pie opened up five months later on um, Loyola's campus. Pequod's opened up that year. And then you had Guy's on the Northwest side, which became Nancy's. And this is the casserole you're talking about here. So the picture on the left is uh, Pequod's. 
And the reason Pequods became famous, and then later birds for cats, um, I am convinced, I wish I would have known more about pizza when I met Bert years ago, he passed away, but I'm convinced that he got the idea for that, that caramelized, burnt mozzarella edge from Detroit, because this is a Detroit hallmark from 1946. Um, and I'm, I'm just certain that this is where that Bert got the idea from, but Bert did it in a round pan, Detroit does it in a rectangular pan, um, and on the right side, you'll see that's uh, my pie. Again, not that high in the middle. Uh, is that my pie? Yeah. So all this stuff is happening in 71. Um, stuffed, by the way, so Rocco Palese is the guy who kind of got the whole story in the new book about how Stuffed was born. I had to find, I had to track down one of my old producers from ABC7. She retired in South Carolina. She was a food critic for the Suburban Sun Times in 71, 72, and she remembers how all this happened and went down. Um, essentially, Rocco Palese, immigrant, wanted to do something different than all these deep dish places opening up in 71, and thought of an Easter pie, a pizza rustica from the old country, which had salami, eggs, and cheese in it, and kind of covered with dough, looked like a pie. So he said, let's do the same thing with pizza. So bottom dough, cheese, usually shredded cheese and toppings, and then a second layer of dough, thinner, and then sauce on top of that. So your sauce is segregated from your toppings, which I don't like because I like when sauce cooks with the ingredients, it kind of marries together. But it's a very different pie. You have this thin, gummy layer of dough across the top, which never gets firm, because remember, the reason you put slices of mozzarella on the bottom of a deep dish is to protect the bottom layer of dough and get it uncut, right? Don't get it cut. Um, when you have a stuffed pie, you have a second layer of dough that sits between sauce above and cheese below. So it's kind of like the texture of a noodle, which a lot of people confuse stuffed and deep. Yes, stuffed is baked in a deep pan, but it is a separate subcategory. I have a whole breakdown of all the categories of pizza in the book as well, which took me a long time, as my wife will attest. Um, so it's a very different pizza. Born in 71, guys eventually became Nancy's, named for Rocco's wife. Two employees who worked in the kitchen from Argentina said they were going to go back to Argentina, where there are a lot of Italians, by the way. And thank you very much, Rocco. Great working with you. And then uh, a year or two later, one of the suppliers for Nancy's tells Rocco, hey, I don't know if you know this, but we're selling the same cheese, sauce, everything to one of your former employees in Marquette Park on the south side, and it's called Giordano's. And so they opened in 74, three years later. But Giordano's, because of their savvy, because of the people who were running the joint, had a much better sense of marketing and had completely kind of pushed Nancy's out of the discussion, out of the picture, in terms of who created stuffed pizza. Um, but this is where out-of-towners say, oh, you casseroles, right? Chicago-style pizza. It didn't come around till 71. So I don't think this is what we all eat. I think it's about maybe 8% of the pizzas you typically see in Chicagoland. But for some reason, because it's so unique, it, be, it, it, it sort of gathers all the attention of, for tourists and visitors. And that's what we're known for. And also, because uh, Giordano went through um, bankruptcy auction and private equity came in uh, from Chicago, actually, and bought the business, they have the capital to expand to Tampa and Indianapolis and Idaho. And so therefore, all those people see Chicago-style pizza, deep dish pizza, even though it's stuffed. See, there's like semantics there. Um, that's what they think of as Chicago style. So it's, it's a little frustrating. This is also why I'm on this mission to sort of set the record straight. The third pizza wave happened recently, last five, uh, five eight years. Chefs begin shifting to pizza. Chefs with lots of knowledge about temperature and uh, fermentation and baking. Um, they're not just sort of throwing dough through a sheer and rolling it out thin and cutting it into squares like their grandfather was. They're actually, they actually understand hydration and temperature and time, and fermentation and natural yeast, and as well as the toppings, how important those are. Um, they're bringing their expertise as bakers. And then consumers want options. I mean, you know, I like Barnaby's as much as the next person, but I can't eat it every day for the rest of my life. I mean, it's great, right? But you want a little bit of variety, which is why you see other styles of pizza coming on the scene. Like 10 years ago, you saw Neapolitan pizza, wood-fired, 
from Naples, old school, 90 degree baking, you know, blistered around the edges. You see these options. So on the right side there, you see Bonchi from Rome, doing pizza al taglio. You see a Sicilian in the middle from uh, Pizza Friendly Pizza in Ukrainian Village. You see a really nice thin pizza, not square tavern, but just thin pizza from a place called Crushed um, in uh, Lincoln Square. So all of a sudden you start seeing these waves that are really kickstarted during the pandemic. So 10 styles, as I said earlier, in the second city. Tavern, and what style, and where is this pizza from, Amy? Barnaby. That's Barnaby's, you can <laughs> tell by the crimped edges, right? By the way, every one of my pizzas when I do my original research is half sausage, half pepperoni, just to be consistent. Um, Chicago is the number one market for sausage pizzas. Even though pepperoni is number one across America in terms of toppings, we are a sausage town because of the Union Stockyards and Swift and Armour started in Chicago, obviously. Um, so bar pie, the party cup, that's what we call it, all right? Then we have our deep dish from 1943, right? Ike, not Ike Sewell, Ike Sewell and Rick Ricardo. Rick Ricardo and Adolfo Malnati created this style of pizza. Um, on the left is from Malnati's, very familiar to most Chicagoans. On the right is from Lefties. Anybody been to Lefties? So as most pizzas have uh, dramatic stories, like there's the Baracos, Vito and Nick's saga on the south side. There's the Barnaby's saga, which has a family member dispute. And there are three different websites for Barnaby's in case you haven't noticed. Um, the two guys who are best friends who bought Bert's pizza uh, when Bert was on his deathbed, literally, they signed the paperwork. They were bringing him the dough they were making, and then he would give them a thumbs up or a thumbs down from the hospital. Um, they opened up Bert's sort of 2.0, after Bert passed away, and then they immediately split. Ever, I don't know why. Um, and one guy left to open up Lefties in Wilmette, and then opened a second Lefties in Highland Park. Uh, it looks very similar to a Bert's or a Pequod's on the right side with the caramelized mozzarella edge, uh, but that is again a sort of a deep pan, we call that, because it doesn't have that high wall like you see at Blues. Okay, stuffed pizza we just talked about. This is from Superosa, but you get these at uh, Angelo's. You can also find them at Giordano's. It's two layers of dough, sauce above the top layer of dough, cheese in the middle. Usually shredded, not sliced. Neapolitan. This is the sort. Of, this is what pizza was hundreds of years ago. From Naples, high heat oven, wood burning oven. By the way, wood does not impart any flavor when you're baking it in an oven like this because it's not barbecue. So when you're smoking brisket for 14 hours, yes, wood makes a big deal in terms of flavor. But when it's baking for 90 seconds, no, it's just a heat source. Uh, there are electric ovens now that bake at 930 degrees Fahrenheit. They do just the same job. Um, but wood is more romantic, of course. And so you see the leopard spotting. We call it on the outside. Typically, Fior de Latte, fresh mozzarella in the middle, San Marzano tomatoes from your Mount Vesuvius. Very thin, very blistered, very wet in the middle, too. Um, quite soupy, because it's a quick bake, so you need knife and fork for Neapolitan. Sicilian, not a style you see a lot of in Chicago. It's only been coming on recently. It's huge in New York. Uh, you get squares everywhere in New York, but I love this style of pizza. It's got an overnight fermentation, typically one or two nights. This particular one is a five-day ferment from Pizza Friendly Pizza in Ukrainian Village in the 1000 block of Northwestern. Uh, really outstanding crust. I was the shidok for this between the chef, who's a two-star Michelin chef from Oriole Restaurant, and a, a pizza guru in Las Vegas named uh, John Arena from Pizza Metro. And I connected those guys, and this was the result of it, the Sicilian pizza. You have bakery slices in Chicago. I think it's a separate style. It is Sicilian at its core, but it is its own unique style. Sicilia Bakery on Cumberland, Sicilian Bakery on Lawrence. This is from D'Amato's on Grand Avenue. It's a softer, juicier slice. Um, when I took this picture, I, I took all the pictures in the book. Um, when I took this picture and I showed it to the owner, Rose, I said, do you approve of this for the book? She said, yeah, that looks juicy. That was a good sign that the slice looked good to her, juicy, which I've never heard described as a, a slice 
as a, a positive, but it's a juicy slice, soft. I think it needs another eight minutes on the stone deck of an oven, frankly, or a pizza stone in your oven to really crisp it up. But this is what they do. Get in the bakery case, eat it right there, or have them heat it up. Detroit, also kind of in the same vein of Sicilian. This started in 1946 at a place called Buddy's in Hamtramck, just outside of Detroit. And it's typically more focaccia-like in the middle, softer, spongier, a bit more oil, uh, crispy underneath, which is why you serve it on a cooling cookie rack to elevate it, to keep the bottom crispy. But really the telltale sign is that frico, it's called. It's technically a term, frico, that goes around the edge of the pie that is crispy and crunchy. It's just basically charred uh, brick cheese from Wisconsin, higher fat cheese. But and this is from Paul E. G's in Logan Square. He uses a white cheddar, um, and then he pipes on fresh ricotta cheese, and he puts fresh basil and Mike's hot honey. And it's just a delicious pizza. We typically stop here on our Saturday bus tour uh, in the season. Roman. So Roman actually has three subcategories, which is really interesting. Um, the one on the top is from Pizzeria Via Stato on State Street next to the Embassy Suites Hotel. That's a tavern-style Roman, just like our tavern-style Chicago. Again, served on a pan with holes in it to have that airflow underneath it so it stays crispy. On the far left side is from Bonchi. That started in Rome, um, Gabriele Bonchi. Over there, it's called the Pizzarium. And you typically will look at a deli case, you'll have a dozen or so flavors, and you tell them how much you want, and then they'll cut it with scissors, and then they will weigh it, and you pay by the pound. That's Roman Altaglio, by the cut. Uh, the one, but, by the way, of those three, or of those two flavors, the one in the front is a potato and mozzarella. Potato and mozzarella is really delicious on a pizza. The one next to it is Induya, which is a spicy, spreadable, collaborated sausage. And on the far left is uh, zucchini and lemon zest with black pepper. So no tomato sauce in any of those. It's kind of interesting. And then the bottom front, that long surfboard, is uh, pizza al metro by the meter. And this is from Bar Cargo in River North, started by one of the Stefani clans, right here at Stefani's restaurant. Their son Anthony opened a, this, he went to Rome, he was inspired by the pizza al metros. Three day fermentation again to create all that open crumb structure inside the pie, inside the pizza. You really, it's really a crust experience, but again, the toppings reflect Rome. So, the big difference between Roman and Neapolitan this is really soft, chewy, pliable, knife and fork. Rome loves crispy, crunchy. The bottom must be crunchy, it must be firm. You must hear the pizza as you're biting into it. That's the big difference between Neapolitan and Roman. And then artisan, and this just means basically a chef's approach to pizza. Long fermentation, like a baker would think about pizza. Uh, lots of water in the raw dough before you bake it. All the toppings are homemade. If this is a mushroom, for example, you would never see it in an artisan place, some chef just throwing on raw mushrooms and then baking it, because what happens when you cook mushrooms or spinach? water comes out of it. And so when you see, when you ever order a mushroom pizza, and I am one of those weird people who will ask the server, do you guys roast or saute the mushrooms before you put them on the pizza? I say, why do you ask? Because if you put raw mushrooms on a pizza and then bake it for 15 minutes, it's gonna be wet and really soggy. And so if you pre-roast or saute the mushrooms and then put it on the pizza, you get all that great flavor without all the liquid. Um, so art is an approach to pizza. And then there's your New York Slices, this is from Jimmy's, and the left is from Jimmy's Pizza Cafe, which just moved to a glorious large new store on Montrose and Campbell. Um, Korean guy who missed New York pizza and just really hit it out of the park. And then on the right side is from Kraft in Wicker Park, also a, just a delicious New York style slice. And um, yeah, you are, there is a whole slice chapter in the book, where to get slices in Chicago. Um, and then maybe eleven styles, right? Thin. We didn't talk about it. We said tavern style, thin, square cut. But how about just a thin pizza cut into wedges with a really thoughtful crust that has this sort of burnished. I always want to liken it to the color of a coach bag, like that deep dark leather brown. I typically want to see three or four shades of brown on my crust 
like tan, light brown, spotted brown, charred, maybe even close to black. But I want to see, you know, that gives me the sense that there's going to be texture and crunch uh, with this with this crust. So I think thin is another one that we should count. And then I just want people to think, when I say Chicago-style pizza, rather than just going right to casserole or deep dish, you know, it's really a city of multiple styles. Um, the one on the right there, that's a, again, pandemic pivot, an Irish bar in Edge Brook on Devon Avenue uh, turned into a, they had a smoker and they started doing it's like smoked pork. And then they started doing Detroit style pizzas because the owner liked Detroit style pizza. And there's a Chicago style of Italian beef pizza. So there's Italian beef and giardinera on that pizza with uh, two lines of tomato sauce across the top. But that charred sort of blackened mozzarella frico around the edge um, as well. And so, yeah, I just want you to think about different styles in Chicago. And so as I wrote the first book, The Pizza City 101, 101 pizzas. That was really sort of a look at Chicago land, kind of what, what the scene is like in the region. The new book is really, if you're coming to Chicago for three or four days, where do you need to eat pizza? You're probably not going to rent a car and go to Warrenville or Naperville um, or Highland Park. You're probably going to spend your time in around the city. But I do have one chapter on the suburbs, what I call suburban stars. Like if you're already going to be visiting someone on the North Shore, you know, yes, you have to go to the Monarchies. You know, yes, you should go to Lefties. Yes, you should go to, what's the place in um, on Green Bay? Grateful Bites, a uh, great place in, uh, is it Winnetka? Covered Woods. Covered Woods, Winnetka, yeah. Um, so I have some must visit in the suburbs, but that's just one chapter. Most of it is city because there are so many amazing pizza places now in Chicago. I just, I cannot keep track of them all. There are over 100. Only one of the places in the book closed uh, because of the pandemic right on Michigan Avenue. Uh, the mozzarella store over by the water tower, it closed. But everything else is still in there. And there's a lot of what we call, this chapter called Pizza Nights and Pop-Ups. A lot of places like the Dock Inn in Bridgeport were doing one night only on Wednesday, wood-fired pizza. Or there's a place in Edgewater, uh, Sauce and Bread, that does an amazing Sicilian pizza once a week. So I, I also wanted to cover those kinds of places because not everybody wants to be a pizzeria per se, but they love pizza and they want to make it because they like the idea of baking and creating something new. Um, like Bill Kim, who was known for Belly Shack and Belly Q, now has pizzas at a concept called Bill Kim's Pizza and Parm Shop. And he's got one in Oak Brook and, and one in Wicker Park, and he does a Korean-style, deep Detroit-style pizza. It's kind of fun. So there's just a lot of folks experimenting these days with pizza. So that's, that's my shtick. Um, any questions about anything? Yes, sir. So when you make dough, you combine yeast, typically commercial yeast like uh, Red Star or Fleischmann's, and some warm water, and you get the yeast to activate, and then you add your flour, and then you let it sit and rest and ferment. And so you're letting the dough create flavor and by letting it ferment. If you make the dough right away, if you make the pizza right away, typically dough hasn't proofed enough. It has to rise a little bit. And you're, what the yeast is doing is it's eating the sugars and it creates carbon dioxide and it gives you that lift, those sort of open crumb structure inside the dough. And so you want to let the dough rest for at least you know several hours at room temperature. A lot of pizza makers will let it rest in the refrigerator and ferment for two days in a cool environment. But you're developing character, you're developing flavor. So whenever somebody says we make our dough fresh every day, okay, that's fine. But are you letting it rest for how long? A day or two or three or four? And you'll find that that sort of sweet spot's about three days. Like Robert's Pizza and Dough Company downtown, which has everybody been to, it's uh, the best pizza downtown, thin, thin crust. He does an na all natural starter. So instead of buying the packet of yeast, and then adding to water, it's commercial yeast, he actually has what's called a natural starter um, where he makes his own starter by using wild yeast and flour and water and feeds it water and flour every day. For, he's been doing it for 20 years. And that all natural starter, he adds a little bit of it to his pizza dough every day and it gives it this really unique sourdough flavor, like sourdough bread. 
And so you want an all-natural starter if you can. If you can't, it's okay. But you also want at least two days of fermentation to develop flavor. Uh, yes, and? that's a coal fire place. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. I like it. We did our we did the last event there. I'm not a chef. No, I didn't go to culinary school. Uh, I just uh, really interested in food and cooking and what goes into it and did a lot of reading about it. Asked a lot of questions. Do you cook? I do cook. Yeah, I made a lot of pizza for the book. Actually, yeah. Uh, two more categories. Good pizza that has been frozen. Uh, like I still like Connie's and Home Run Inn, but there are others that are awful. And the second, the, the, your 12th category is awful pizza. Like, <laughs> like Domino's. How do they stay in business? You know, it's a classic throw away the pizza, eat the box. Yeah. Like um, um, I, I don't eat a lot of frozen pizza, to be honest with you. Uh, I do like Home Run Inn um, for frozen, but. Uh, yeah, the throwaway stuff, like the chains, I just never go there. There's no reason to. We have so many great independent mom and pops that make great pizza here. So I don't. I think they're popular because they're just accessible and affordable, and they're everywhere. You know, if you live in Stickney or Homer Glen, it's easier to find a Domino's. Chains are popular because there's marketing money behind them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah a lot of money behind it. If you drive to Detroit, you've got to pass down the farm. Mm. Little Caesars family owns all sports teams in Detroit. The Iliad, sure, they're from Detroit. Yeah. So, first of all, it's a great presentation. You do it yourself. It's a pizza in history. Um, this is a broader question. How do you go to four pizza places a day? How do you do what you do? And look like it. Yeah. <laughs> Quite seriously. How do you have the discipline? We go, Brotherhood goes to uh, farmers uh, once every three months or something like that. We sit down and we have like a piece of peace, right? And, and I have no discipline. How do you have to discipline? discipline. To, to I, just, I just know that I'm going to be eating a lot. I can't eat that much. And um, as I've gotten older, it's just it's easier for me to have self-control. I just I can't eat a whole thing of french fries or a whole pizza anymore. Um, I just, I'm really good at tasting. I'm really good at exercising. I've been really good about core power yoga almost every day. You sell us some of that. Sure. And the discipline is important. Everything in moderation. If I have a really busy day of eating, I will make sure the next day I don't eat very much. Like I'm, my equilibrium is really good. Yeah. Were there any pizzas that did take more than two bites? Yeah, Roberts for sure. Roberts and Polly G's. Those are hard to put down. Question was, um, what is your thoughts on like Chicago pizza, like oven grinders, like the those kind of? Yeah, um, warm. Um, not a fan of oven grinder. I, I don't really call it pizza. It's more like melted cheese in a red bowl. Yeah. 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 When you go to a restaurant to uh, check it out, are you going anonymously, or do they know who you are, or do you go under a pseudonym? No, I always go anonymously. Yeah, I just I go as is. I don't you don't. Know, you're not announced ahead of time. Absolutely not. I know some people like leftover pizza better than fresh pizza, just by eating it to crispier. Like, what are your thoughts on reheating? Um, you can reheat it on a pizza stone or a pizza steel. I think you can freeze pizza also, but I like preheating the oven as high as it goes, five five fifty with a pizza stone in the oven, preheated for half an hour at least, and then throw it on that stone directly, and then five minutes, six minutes is good. Or yeah. casting. Hmm? Cast or cast iron, yeah. yeah. Or if it's a delicate, if it's a Neapolitan pie, which does not travel well at all, but you could reheat those in a cast iron on the stove. Um, what's your opinion on bakers? It's bakers are really big on the top side. Yeah, not a fan. I went to Beggars for the first book. It's just, it's overkill. Too much cheese. Um, a lot of times underdone. Because you've got multiple locations, there's also not a lot of consistency there. Lou's does, does a very good job with their consistency and their training, I think. Beggars, I just did not love. I just want to talk about your show. Uh, I watch it religiously and I watch the DC. Thanks. Uh, 
Your show now is more what I want to call people food. You know, you're not going to find dining like you might be telling me for tacos or something. Uh, what caused that pivot? Um, I just think it's how people eat. I mean, I base a lot of the stuff I do based on what people respond to. I, I'm still going to do fine dining every now and then, uh, but I just think generally, you know, people want suggestions for where to go. They want something unique. I don't need to tell them, here's another Italian restaurant that opened up near you. Um, but I do want to educate people about dishes and ingredients and kind of things you may not have seen before. So I've done some interesting stuff recently about like Cambodian or Indian or, but then I'll do pizza every now and then. I just try to mix it up, just try to keep it interesting. And so it's not always the same style of, of coverage. I like it just a little bit. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. What is your absolutely number one place? Like, if you okay. only could go to one? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is either exactly the right gift or the exact wrong gift. It's okay. a certificate of food steps. But oh, thanks. I wanted to say thank you so much. So much. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Yes. Thank you. You weren't going to give him a Domino's <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me? Um, our member Alon was wondering what is his, what is your absolutely number one place if you have one? Roberts. 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 Yeah. And where is that? Four sixty five North Clerk. River East. Where would you recommend a good whole whole Brooklyn style? Um. Jimmy's probably Jimmy's Pizza Cafe. Yeah, it's in the book. Jimmy's, Jimmy's is great. Yeah, and on weekends he does squares, which are really, really good too. Like Sicilian. So I grew up in Detroit, and I'm a huge fan of Detroit style pizza. Um, but I haven't found a place here that comes too close. It's insane. Well, let me. Have you spent any time in other cities looking? other pizzas to actually compare them to like the different styles. So like you're looking at New York style pizza here, comparing it to New York style pizza, Detroit style pizza. Yeah, I mean, I've been to New York and Detroit extensively. Um, I think Polly G's Logan Square, uh, Fat Chris's in Andersonville. Have you heard of those places for Detroit style? Yeah. Um, there's one up here called B Square. It's not very good, yeah. Um, but I would go to Polly G's and uh, Fat Chris's, and even that Edge, the one in Edgebrook, uh, what's it called? City's Edge Bar. That's a pretty de de decent Detroit style. Um, but yeah, yeah, you'll find stuff in the book for sure. There's a place in Andersonville that got yeah, a huge write up a couple years back, probably five plus years. You try to go in there, it would be like a two hour wait. Oh, Great Lake. Yeah, yeah Great Lake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No yeah. Seating or GQ anything. magazine said it was the best pizza in America. Yeah. Um, right. Oh, yeah, I know those folks. Um, they were supposed to open another place this year. Okay. Uh, but they haven't yet because they're, they're crazy. Is it worth it? <laughs> yeah. It is worth it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I think Roberts is the closest to that style of crust. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Great Lake. Great Lake. It doesn't exist. Florida. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah. I have been many times. I could probably answer on the phone. Yeah.